The following was a conversation that I had with Steven Fiorillo to go over the Q3 numbers that SoFi has released. Now, aside from being the founder of Barbell Capital, he's also an author on Seeking Alpha where he talks about a ton of different companies, but most in particular, SoFi Stock, where from what I could see going through, he is the largest writer for SoFi Stock and goes into the very, very in-depth details for all of their different business models. And we cover that in this following video. If you guys enjoy the video, make sure you guys like the video, subscribe down below, and make sure you go check out Steven's Seeking Alpha page. What did you think about Q3? And uh, how do you feel about the numbers? What are your thoughts? Yeah, sure. So Tanner, thanks for having me. Really looking forward to having a conversation. And just like to say to your audience, whatever I say is my own opinion. This is not financial information. It's for research purposes only. Just because I am bullish on SoFi does not mean it is a good position where it fits in your portfolio or your investment parameters. So please take everything with a grain of salt and do your own due diligence. So to answer your question, I I really liked Q3. I thought they did a phenomenal job and we learned a lot of things. And, uh, you know, from the lending segment to the membership growth, just to the EBITDA, to everything, it was really impressive, all the numbers. Right, right. Um, now, I, I was also a super fan uh, of the you know the lending side and everything like this, what I was a little bit disappointed on was the technology platform. What was this all about? How how come the revenue uh, didn't really make any growth yet? You know the actual amount of accounts did. What what did you what did you make of that? <laughs> I take everything with a grain of salt. I am looking at this as investment. I am tying capital up for at least five to ten years. I've often said that this is a company that. I am looking out to 2030 with. This isn't something where it's 2023 and I'm exiting. I have a very long-term projection on it. Now, for the technology segment, while it wasn't monetized as some would have liked, I think we're at the very beginning stages and we're just starting to see the repercussions of incorporating Technesis with Galileo. And to me, it's not, not about the revenue now. It's about getting everything on that single stack, multi-core tenant and the savings. Right. So I'm looking at it as Galileo is going to be able to get more clients and generate more revenue because they can cross sell products and they can bring more features to their current customers in addition to when they are in a bidding war for additional clients and they're in that boardroom in an RFP, they're coming in there with so much more firepower because they're able to provide so many more things than their competitors can. So technology wasn't jaw-dropping numbers, but it doesn't need to be right now. I'm more focused in what it can become. When you add Galileo on Technesis and back it with the SoFi Banking Charter. You are going to have an AWS of FinTech, and I don't know of another banking institution or FinTech company that owns each individual component and can back it with the bank charter. And it's critical because not only will SoFi be able to come to market and build their products for what their members want as fast as they possibly can without having to depend on a third-party vendor, they're going to be able to provide their exact software to any other company that is in the fintech space or even a regional bank, a thrift bank, the traditional banking system that's still an archaic band-aid progression system that is not optimized in the cloud. And they're gonna be able to generate so much revenue from being the actual platform that's hosting and for the other institutions that don't have a bank charter. So if I can bank it with their banking charter, like it, it's so powerful that I'm just, I'm not too concerned about it. What was your take on it? You know, in, in the short term, I, I, I speculated that, you know, what I was worried about is if we were lowering a take rate um, just on the revenue side, because my, my, my problem was, is that uh, I think it was Chris Lapointe came out and said that um, the amount of member growth, it, it's, it's a big uh, you know, forward indicator for future revenue and that the clients that we get now are not actually going to be profitable for two to three quarters in the future. Um, or well, not profitable, but sorry, uh, bringing in revenue. But yet the higher growths that we saw in uh, Galileo came from three quarters ago. So I feel like now is when the revenue should start to actually, you know, be climbing quite quick and we're just not seeing it. I don't understand how 
uh, if that's true, and we saw the growth from you know last year and during the, the during the times of the pandemic, how is it possible that now we're seeing members outgrow the the revenue? I feel like it should honestly be the opposite way around, and it's, it doesn't seem to be the case. I think that's a great question to send in for the Q and A. LaPointe's the one that really could answer that, and you make a very valid point on that. You would think that it would be inverted to what it is now. It makes complete sense, and. I don't know. I don't have an answer for it. I didn't see anything that would shed light on it in the Q3, but I'm sorry, in the 10Q, but I could have missed it. Right. I don't know. I didn't read it word for word, but I did go through it pretty diligently. But I'm not concerned. I'm more focused on the other numbers. I'm more focused on deposits. I'm more focused on member growth, especially the financial products and the cross selling. Right. To me, that's the bread and butter. Right, right. And so this was a, a big piece of yours on your most recent article on Seeking Alpha that you spoke about deposit growth versus the top 25 biggest financial institutions uh, in, in America. Yeah, and so I did it against the top five in the article, but I expanded it in Twitter because some people had said I cherry picked. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I follow you everywhere. So I, I get <laughs> I'm getting mixed up. But yeah, I mean, look, I use the big banks that I was familiar with. I, I'm not familiar with everything. Um, I am familiar with JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, and UBS. That's why I put them in there. And then I looked at the largest institutions in the US and Goldman Sachs does not have their deposits in the balance sheet on Seeking Alpha, nor does Morgan Stanley. So I excluded them because I was only using what I could find on Seeking Alpha. And I expanded to the top 25. And what SoFi is accomplishing is nothing short of amazing. Right. Compared to all the other banks. They weren't the absolute highest. I think they came in fourth out of 25, maybe third. They're definitely in the top five from what I remember. I don't have it open. Their percentage growth was the highest. But once again, I, I'm not one of those people that goes by percentage growth because when you're starting from somewhere very small. It's very easy to get very large percentage growth numbers. I'm looking at the overall dollar deposit increase and what they've done in two and a half quarters is it's amazing. Well, I'd, I'd like to see those numbers of, of, you know, sheer dollar value compared to how many members are on all the platforms. You know what I mean? It might show uh, per person <laughs> how how drastic that the uh, the deposits were were changed. Right. And yeah, I uh, mean, we could back our way into it pretty easily. It's interesting. I like that idea. Maybe I'll start tracking that. If you don't mind, we could go back to Q2 because that was the full, first full quarter of having the banking charter and look at how many members to deposit and just net it out per member on the right. average. And then do the same thing for Q3 and just keep going forward and look if it's on a per member basis, if it's going up or down. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, another thing that I like looking at, if we're if we're talking about the financial services sector, what I didn't realize is they brought up in the uh, the quarter. I spoke about this on one of my videos, but uh, I felt like not a lot of people were talking about this is that Chris LaPointe pointed out our average revenue per product on our financial services uh, segment. And it was about thirty four dollars this quarter up like I, I forget what the exact number is. I'll put it up on screen, but um, it was thirty four dollars per product. And then I was looking at other institutions that were sort of compared uh, in the general vicinity, like like Robinhood, for example, and you know they're doing a much higher number, like sixty three dollars, but it was on a per user basis. And and I wonder what your thoughts are, considering uh, you know people are speculating about this options product coming out. Do you do you have any thoughts on a per product basis, or do you just sort of look at it as a you know a, a bigger company in general? I think per product is hard because there could be some obscure ones that a lot of members really aren't taking advantage of or don't have a need for. I think. If they were to list out, this is my own speculation, if they were to break out the revenue per product, I think you'd see a very large aggregate up at the top and then it funneled down to a very minimal toward yeah. the bottom. Yeah. I think it's going to be your top, very top heavy. Right, right. But as for your question, I don't follow Robinhood closely. I glance through the presentation. It's not a company I follow. I'm not a shareholder. I don't follow Upstart or Lending Club or any of them. Um, 
not shareholder, so I don't pay too much attention to it. I am a shareholder of SoFi, so I pay attention to what they're doing. And I mean, I'm not concerned about the revenue per product. I'm concerned about the overall revenue. To me, it's more about the flywheel and being able to cross sell and having a banking solution for what its members want. And to me, that's the biggest thing because a lot of people use different banking institutions for different things, or they have a mortgage with a different banking institution than they have their direct deposit with checking or their brokerage account. Everything is parceled out. I think SoFi has a real opportunity to change banking. I think the younger generation has a much smaller attention span and is looking for the most efficient way possible to get the job done. And they're never going to know life without a cell phone, without the internet, without tablets. They are a connected generation. It just shows you what the mentality is. Everything is instant gratification. And I think SoFi has a great app. I am a member. They really built a great app. And I think with them having everything there and having a product for everything, I think people are going to gravitate to staying within that cycle of all the different products in SoFi and utilize SoFi for multiple aspects of their financial needs. Yeah, I just wanted to pick your brain on the idea of 2023, where we're going to sort of go in, you know, into student loans or these sorts of things. What are you looking forward to? Do you, do you find we're too top heavy in the personal loan segment? And how is this going to help with our diversification and everything along those lines? No, I love where we're at with personal loans. I love where we're at because in Q1 of 2020, we were over $2 billion with originations and student loans. And it looks like Q1, just past Q1, we passed the $2 billion point and we haven't looked back. We've kept on appreciating in what we're originating on, this, on the personal loans. And we're approaching $3 billion. I'm hoping that Q4 we see three billion on that because it was somewhere around 2.6, I think. I have a graph in front of me. I don't have the numbers. It looks like it was around 2.6, 2.7 billion. But I love it because it's showing that this is a company that had to overcome tremendous adversity. Student loans was their bread and butter. And it just got stopped dead in its tracks when the moratorium came out. The goal post kept on moving. And it's been operating at under 50% capacity, except for one quarter when it looked like the moratorium was going to end. It was Q4 2021. You had people start refinancing. And then it fell off a cliff again. And they were able to pick up the slack on an overall basis through the personal loans. And when student loans are eventually unfrozen, and you have people with student debt starting to refinance. I am hoping that SoFi is a major player once again in that area. And I think when the Fed finally pivots, who knows when it's going to be, it could be two years until we see the Fed fund rates start coming down and mortgages start coming down. You could see mortgage rates at 10% in the right. US. That is a real possibility, even though people don't want to admit it. It's a possibility. But at some point, they will start to come down and you will have more people refining. And that line on the home loan originations will start going up again. And you'll have those three segments firing all, all cylinders. It may be 2024, 2025, but it's going to be a beautiful thing when it happens. Do, do you think that we're starting to get into riskier territories as uh, from, I think you saw my video charts are showing that maybe we're getting into lower FICO scores on all three of our lending products. And does that worry you? Does, does the default rates worry you? Any sort of basis on whether we think there's going to be, going to be a credit crunch or anything along these lines that might uh, increase our, our losses on our, our credit side? Anything I would say would be pure speculation. So I'd rather not say anything because I don't have a crystal ball and I don't want to paint a rosy scenario or a doom and gloom scenario. What I would say is I am fairly certain that SoFi has some pretty intelligent actuaries working for them that have come up with a model for them to stay within. Every one of these banks at some point has loans go bad. And that's why the actuaries create the models. So I'm not too worried 
because of the standards that SoFi has put in place. If that changes, we have to revisit that as an investment thesis. But right now, I don't think it's a concern. So you said that Q3 in your in your earnings, uh, or sorry, in your article has decimated the bear case. Is there anything else left to stand on? And and what sort of is the worries then if uh, if not, you know, potentially a, a, a credit crunch or something along these lines? There's a bear case for any stock. You can make a bear case for Apple if you want, even though it's six or 7% of the S&P. Like a bear case can be made for any stock. And I, I use those words because every negative aspect that people like to bring up about SoFi, this is a company that continues to outperform outperform on those areas and so far it is still a risky investment but at the end of the day they are doing the right things they are trending in the right direction and you're not seeing quarter over quarter declines in members in deposits in galileo accounts they had three consecutive beat and raises to me that is what is decimating the bear case because a company that came out in the beginning of the year had to pivot and change their outlook due to the student loan moratorium not ending i believe it was may was supposed to end so they had to readjust their guidance and then on q1 they raised guidance q2 they raised guidance q3 they raised guidance right Right. So I don't know how bearish you can get on it. And okay, sure, they're not profitable. I know as an investor and putting my personal money into it, I know they're not profitable. I'm not investing in this as if it was Coca-Cola or Apple or Google. This is a growth play, it is a speculative play, and it has the prospects to be a heavy hitter in the financial institution rank. It's going to take time to play out and maybe it doesn't happen. From everything I'm seeing, I think it is going to happen. When I take into consideration what the trends on the Gen Z demographic is, when you think about the kids that are getting their first jobs, the kids that are coming out of high school, going to college, working, who are they more likely to open a checking account with? I think there's a good argument to be made that SoFi is a contender for them to do their banking. No, 100%. 100%. Now, in, in the latest article or in the latest uh, quarter, they also spoke about on the earnings call that they want to stick around this 400,000 new members per, per quarter, right? And I wonder, is that something that, that you think is a good idea? Like they're they're very, very strict on this on the 70-30 split of how they're sort of managing their growth. Do you think that they should open themselves up to flexibility so then they can capitalize on certain you know opportunities? Or do you think it's smart to stick at this 30% to the bottom line? Or what do you think? I think that what Anthony Noto has said, he knows the business way better than I do. So I got to put my trust in him. You know, if he thinks yeah. 70, 30 is the right split to drive to the bottom line, who am I to argue with him? Yeah, he he's definitely he definitely has the track record. And I wonder if he continues to put out quarters like this over and over and over. I don't see a world where the stock doesn't also start to give him some execution credit and say that, you know, if anyone's going to be able to do it, it might be able to be the SoFi team because they're they're clutching it out where most competitors are not seeming to have a good quarter this quarter. And, and that seems to be a pretty good outlier. Yeah, I think a lot of people are looking for stock-based compensation to go down. I think a lot of people are looking for net income. I think a lot of people who are bearish or undecided are looking at the adjusted EBITDA numbers and thinking, what is adjusted EBITDA? Why are they reporting on adjusted EBITDA? And You're not a big fan of uh, adjusted anything, right? The reason I say I don't like adjusted numbers is because it's a lot easier when you compare companies against other peers to evaluate them on the same number and not every company gives the adjusted numbers. I want to be able to compare this, these companies together, but as far as what SoFi is generating, they are generating positive adjusted EBITDA. It's growing and eventually that's going to mean net income in the positive territory. We could get there next year. It all depends. And and do you think that um you know we fully utilize the bank already and like a lot of the growth in our EBITDA has also just come from this massive step from you know no banking charter to now using deposits and and starting to fund all the loans through there. Have we you know sort of ran out of that growth 
and and things are going to start flattening out or, or what do you think so when we say growth let's be very specific well, are we talking percentage growth or are we talking yeah number? so so percentage growth on adjusted EBITDA is specifically what i'm talking about it's still early so i don't think percentage growth will flatten out yet but at some point as i said before you're not going to have triple digit percentage growth indefinitely but we're in the early innings and it's all going to depend about deposits and membership growth. And if SoFi stays on this trajectory, we need another year or two to really make some solid projections. But I think if we can get another four quarters of data with these trends, it'll show a picture. And we're going to be able to make some really good projections on where this could go because your question will be answered. Has growth stalled? Has it kept pace? Have we added a respectable amount on a numbers basis? I think it's on the early innings. And depending on what the membership growth and the deposit growth looks like, we may see, see big jumps in revenue over the next couple of years too. Right. They haven't had a banking charter for a solid year yet. Let's see what the 2023 fiscal year looks like when you've had a banking charter for a full solid year and look at the what the results are. Let's look at what their deposit number is at the end of 2023 and how much they're doing in loans and what the spread is and how much they're generating off that. And even, I, I don't think people give enough credit. I always see people talking about SoFi. They talk about the lending department and they talk about the technology platform. No one seems to be giving any credit to the financial services platform, even though it's so new. I think we're making great strides there and and this could become a massive part of our business that I think no one's going to see coming. I feel like the numbers are right there, right? You look at those are our biggest uh, products, you know, invest in money platform or our money products. And then the percentage of our users that are actually going to direct deposit, I think they said it was 50% of new money um, members actually used direct deposit within their first 30 days of signing up. That's an incredible statistic. And I feel like uh, just personally, no one's really looking at how all three of our segments are actually outperforming, in, in my opinion. I mean, if anything, last quarter didn't really show a great technology platform. But like you said, with the AWS of fintech coming. We're still building it. it it's right. not finished yet. We're not seeing the benefits of the acquisition yet. And it, it, we all knew it was going to take time. If you go back to the presentation that they put on their website when they made the acquisition of Technesis. We are so far away from recognizing all the benefits that we're just gonna have to wait. I'm fine waiting because at the end of the day, there are only so many companies that can do what that company can do. SoFi owns the entire corridor. They own the cyber bank, they own the back end processing, and they own a bank charter. I even wonder sometimes like whenever I'm thinking about um you know the AWS of fintech what i wonder about is with the banking charter right we'll be able to eventually end up offering these new customers or or new clientele the offer of managing the actual money for them but yet every client that actually signs up they seem to have chosen a different uh you know bank sponsor for their cash management accounts and i wonder is it just too early in the process that maybe we haven't built that part out and that we don't offer that as you know sofi bank because i feel like that would be a obvious cross sell for some of these people that we can offer them like you said the payment processing side the actual back end you know banking core and then also hey we'll manage the money for you now that we actually have the bank charter but yeah, i haven't seen it yet and i think you hit it on the head that's just too early i don't know what they are saying and i don't know when galileo is in that room and when they are trying to get new customers if it's available yet but at some point, they were very clear that they will be able to do all those things. And this could be they are waiting until it's a full 360 encompassing product where they can do everything and give them the same platform that they're using. Because keep in mind, SoFi is not 100% up on this platform yet. They're still building it. They're still integrating. And that yeah. could be why. I mean, we'll see. The I think my little um, conspiracy, I guess, would be that, and I think Anthony Noto spoke about this a little bit, but SoFi is a guaranteed customer of Galileo and Technicis. That, that's a guarantee. So why Anthony. even put manpower towards changing our own systems out when this is like a gold rush right now to make sure that you know this new platform actually reaches as many customers as possible? Why put any manpower into trying to convince SoFi to to change it over? We don't need that right now. You know, go out, 
you know, get the customers, then worry about actually fixing our own system. And that that's why I think they they put it all the way out to 2024, 2025. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I don't have any information, obviously, about how they're doing things, but it would make sense to me that they're trying to move all their products onto that single core multi-tenant and get the finalized product done. And they're going to forego the revenue up front from chasing clients on what could be. And then they'll go after them when it is a real product, because not only are they going to generate a ton of savings I and mean, you're looking at what is that 700 million six to 700 million through the 2020s on savings when they finally move everything over so you have that on the operational expense that disappears and you're going to be able to drive revenue and come in with a product that nobody else has there's the other payment processors there's other cyber banks, but there's nobody that can do the trifecta together. And I think that right. that's what they're waiting for. And I'm okay if that's the vision. I'm okay for going the technology side revenue now to be the one product that everybody looks to in the future and getting that cost savings in the near term. It's about being a long-term investor. So if you're in this for the short term, you want everything now, now, now. I can say, sit here and say, I'm okay with it because I've given it another seven years. I mean, we're almost at 2023. I keep saying 2030. I'm holding this for at least seven years, unless something happens that makes me change my investment thesis. Yeah. So if I'm sitting here and waiting two years for the AWS of FinTech, that's not a long time for me. Yeah. You know what? Compounding interest or, or compounding growth in general is such a, a magical tool that people don't seem to understand sometimes. Like, look at where our members were just last year. If we continue to hold up this sort of growth rate, we're not even going to be talking about the same company even two years from now. The you know the member growth will be so insane that we're we're looking at completely different valuations. I think that's the amazing thing of, of buying at a time like this. Now I, I find especially in the YouTube space, and I, I I'm hoping you agree with me on this. A lot of people are looking for catalysts. Okay, is there a catalyst that we need in the short term, or do we just need patience? What does catalyst really mean? People are looking for something to drive the stock price higher. I. I'm not looking for the stock price to go higher so I can get out of my position. And I think that that's something that everybody needs to take into consideration is that why are you buying a stock? And I always say this to my friends, if you're going to invest in something, be honest with yourself. Why are you buying it? Why are you investing your money in this company? And what is your goal for it? I have very specific goals for SoFi. I think that it's a speculative investment. There are certainly risks. But when you look at where they can be in seven to 10 years from now versus where other companies can be, there is more potential for upside appreciation in SoFi stock, in my opinion, than I would get in another investment. And that's why SoFi is on the speculative side in the growth basket of my portfolio, because it has the potential to recognize huge gains. You look at all those, and I hate using the bagger definition or terminology. But you look at all the articles that come out from a lot of these publications, the next five bagger, the next 10 bagger, and I hate that terminology. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's crazy to think that SoFi could be a 25 or a $50 billion market cap company in 2030 if these trends keep going the way they're going. And right. if it does do that, the market cap right now is under 6 billion, I believe. So, you know, I have a lot of time on my side and you gotta be in these companies for the long term. If you're looking for a catalyst to make some money, then you are sitting there looking at charts, looking at the volume, and that's not what I do. So in the short term, maybe there's some catalyst, maybe, People see a huge spike when the student loan moratorium officially is over. That could cause it to go up in the short term, but great. I'm not going to sell if it go even if it goes up and comes back down. I'm not selling. Whenever people are are shown, you know, the idea that well, if it's something that you want to buy and it's a great stock and it's going down, it's a great time to purchase your your stocks. Like it, it's the thing you want on sale, and and everyone hears this and they go, of course. But then once they actually are holding that asset. 
you know, as, as it's starting to to go down, just just by people's sentiment that you know the actual idea of of holding it during that time uh, completely changes, and it's it's a sad truth because I, I've never been that way. If unless the actual business changes, right? If if something is warranting a change and and maybe the you know the bull thesis changes then maybe it's time to sell your position but i don't feel like i'm seeing that at all at sofi i feel like things are strong in a very bad time and if if you know the macro environment changes that it's going to look very good for sofi even in the short term if it stays depressed i'm going to buy more when i can yeah i think that's a good summary of it at the end of the day you have individuals that own uh, shares in a publicly traded company and they don't read the quarterly reports. They don't read the balance sheet. They don't read the income statement. They don't read the cash flow statement. They don't do any additional research and they don't do the ongoing maintenance research. And to me, I don't own a single stock that I don't do the ongoing research on. So for all, any company I'm invested in, if a stock is going down, but the trends on the numbers are going how I want them to go, I'm not going to change my investment thesis unless there's some crazy news about a lawsuit or something coming out that I have to evaluate for the future. But if there's no extenuating circumstances and the numbers are going the trajectory that I want it to go, my thesis hasn't changed. And for SoFi, yes, it's gone down. Nobody likes to lose money. Nobody likes to see their investments decline. Did anybody think Amazon was going to go down 50%? Right. I mean, granted, I'm not happy about their cash from operations, and that's a completely different story. And people are overlooking a lot of things with Amazon. I've been a shareholder for a long time, love the company. But nobody would have said in the late 2021 that, oh, this time next year, Amazon's going to be down 40 50%. Yeah. Think about this. Apple generated $99.8 billion of net income in their fiscal year 2022. They do not report on a calendar year. Their fiscal year ended and they reported on October 28th, I believe. $99.8 billion of net income. And the stock in the next five days went down 11, 12%. Yeah. Should yeah. have been celebrated. So you can't predict what the market's going to do. Right. You just can't do it. Anybody who can predict it, they're better investor than me. I can't predict what the market's going to do day to day. That's why I don't day trade or do any of that stuff. I would drive myself crazy. Buy and hold. And what would you honestly have preferred? Would you have preferred whenever SoFi was at even $15 a share that during all these months, it just stayed stagnant? Or would you have preferred these dips? I feel like I'm, I hold so many more shares now because of this dip. And you know, my actual thesis hasn't changed. So I'm actually it's super excited. I would be holding a lot less shares if it stayed up uh, where it was. I mean, maybe my liquidity would have been different, but I'm not looking to sell at all anyway. Yeah. A lot of people like to use the Amazon example that it went from 106 to $6 or whatever it went to right. back in the dot-com crash. Yes, it's a great example, but it's a completely different company. Your line of thinking is a lot better because at the end of the day, if you're a long-term investor and you had two years to accumulate when the stock was going down, you're holding a lot more shares than if you had just bought at 15 or 20 and it just stayed stagnant. It's painful in the short term, but this could be an opportunity where investors are looking back at this period and like, well, I'm glad I did that. No, exactly. Any last thoughts? What should we know about SoFi? Anything that you've been sort of fiddling with or, or thinking about on SoFi that maybe you'd want to share here? I think everybody should go watch Anthony Noto's speech from Stanford University. I think it was about four years ago. You can find it on YouTube. Tanner may be able to link it in the description of this video. It's one of the greatest speeches from a CEO. It really is. I really would encourage people watch it. And Pay attention to the deposits and just pay attention to the member growth and just the, the same metrics that they've been holding themselves accountable to with revenue and adjusted EBITDA for now. And let's give the banking charter a full year in 2023 and see where they're at. I think that right now it is so early. I don't believe this is a company that's going away. They could, and it could be a horrible investment. We're not going to know for quite some time. We need to see what the trends are. Right now, the trends are very strong and it's gonna be interesting to see whenever student loans come back. Right now, it's supposed to be January. Who knows what's gonna happen? The goalpost has moved so many times. Whenever that occurs, that business line is going to pick up again. And I think so many people misunderstand 
what that means. The most people are getting reimbursed is $20,000 from a Pell Grant, from what I recall. The more normal reimbursement is $10,000. The average student loan holder is 70,000, I believe. So on the best case scenario, you still have $50,000 in debt. And in the semi scenario, you have 60,000. Chances are that those loans are gonna get refinanced. So just because there is student loan forgiveness, it's not 100%. And what's better, having a moratorium forever or having student loan forgiveness and the moratorium lift, and there's a balance that needs to be refinanced. Yeah. We're going to pick up revenue from that. Uh, yeah, so, I, I think the, the moratorium getting pushed is a much worse of a blow for SoFi than the actual forgiveness, especially for people that are making under $125,000 a year, which is not even really our clientele for the most part. A lot of the clientele, it's not going to be applicable to them. And, you know, if the goalposts get moved again, it's not going to be pretty. But on the bright side, this is a company that has had to deal with this for so long. And you look at their revenue in 2019, and then you look at what they did in 2020, 2021, and now 2022, when it's all said and done. This is a company that in the face of adversity has been able to pivot, build other businesses, and grow without their largest business segment. That story in itself is so powerful because when that business segment comes back online, you're going to get everything firing all cylinders and it's really going to pick up hopefully speculating right there but you could see big jumps in revenue and we did we need more time but banking is something we're all going to need and i just want to go over a few stats real quick you have a couple minutes yeah for sure all right so this is why i am very bullish on sofi's future there's a company called 99 firms that has a lot of stats on gen z and they said 95 percent of teens report they have a smartphone or access to one 55 percent of gen z uses their smartphone for five or more hours per day think about that five or more hours per day gen zers spend eight hours per day online 74 percent of gen zers spend their free time online 80 percent of gen zers aspire to work with cutting edge technology. So you are seeing a younger generation that all they know is technology. They don't know life without these products and it's ingrained to their brains, instant gratification. Now, Business Insider did an article and they cited a study done by Bank of America Research. I'll send you the link to this. One of the passages in there was, in a little over a decade, Gen Z will be taking over the economy. Gen Z currently earns seven trillion across its 2.5 billion person cohort according to bank of america research by 2025 that income will grow to 17 trillion and by 2030 it will reach 33 trillion representing 27 percent of the world's income and surpassing that of millennials the following year yeah <laughs> so when you think about the younger generation are they going to go with legacy banking or cloud-based native applications such as SoFi? And now that SoFi has a banking charter, people are more receptive to it because, okay, they're a real bank. FIDC, real bank, banking charter, they have all these products, click of a button, I have all these options at the touch of a button in the ecosystem for cross-selling. Everything is efficient, and this generation is going to be the generation we've seen it throughout history. Eventually, the next generation takes over and has more money than the previous generation. So they're not going after me. They could care less about me as a client. They're going after the younger generation because eventually that's where the money is going to be. We're seeing technology evolve. Technology does not stop evolving. And I think that one of these companies is going to be the next big financial institution I'm not saying jp morgan and bank of america is going to go away because i don't think they're going to but that doesn't mean that a new fintech can't break into the top 10 in due time and i think so far is that company i, I think so as well I, I think so as well and i think anthony Noto is the man for the job <laughs> yeah i mean you can't say enough good things about him